This is a podcast from the British Library. For more information, visit www.bl.uk forward slash podcast. Hello, my name is Ellie Russell and today I'm speaking to Patricia Lovett by phone about a new book just published by the British Library, the Macclesfield Alphabet book, A Facsimile. Patricia has written from the perspective of a scribe in the introduction and Christopher de Hamel has written about the provenance of the manuscript. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Ellie. Could you explain what the Macclesfield Alphabet book is? Well, it is an absolutely fascinating book, and it is a little bit, does exactly what it says on the tin, in that it is a book produced on vellum with quills and with original pigments of different sorts of alphabets. Some of them are written, some of them are painted, some of them are drawn, but it is an absolutely fascinating and possibly unique collection of alphabets. What is so wonderful about it is that it was bought by the British Library in 2009, and so it has been saved for the nation. And this facsimile has been brought out so quickly, only a year later, we have this absolutely marvellous facsimile. And it is something that is of interest, in my view, not only to practitioners like myself, but also people interested in history, people interested in design, people interested in art, and, of course, people interested in manuscripts as well. What was the Macclesfield Alphabet book used for? It's difficult to say exactly what it was used for because it is really a series of of quite disparate alphabets. They don't seem to go in sequence from one to the other. One doesn't lead on to the other. One doesn't get more complicated as you go through the book. It's obvious that it was produced at different times. What it was actually used for is so difficult to say. Um, Was it something that was used in a workshop? So someone would go to a workshop and say, I would like a manuscript, and the practitioner would say, well, would you like this, or would you like that, or would you like the other? Difficult to say that. Um, Was it something that a practitioner kept for themselves so that they could practice? Was it something that was presented Um, as a complete book to someone interested in this sort of thing. We know that herbals, which in a way are quite similar because they are records of different things in that way, were produced uh, for collectors, even though perhaps they weren't doctors or people interested in what the recipes of the herbal would contain. So it's really difficult to say what it was used for. You mentioned in your introduction that the book's written on vellum. How do you actually write on vellum? Well, the vellum in the Macclesfield Alphabet book, for me as a practitioner, as a scribe and an illuminator, is fascinating because it's actually quite furry. You can't see this, obviously, in the facsimile, but you can see it in the original book. And that would have meant that the scribe, when they're actually doing the writing, had a really good tooth. And this is the reaction of the writing implement, and obviously at this time they would have used quills, with the writing surface which um, I think is vellum as opposed to parchment, which is sheepskin. And it needs to be treated. You need to take the grease out of it with pounce, which is powdered pumice stone and cuttlefish, and you need to slightly roughen the surface to get that good tooth that I was just talking about. And then they would have used quills for the lettering, and quills, obviously, as everybody knows, come from birds, they are feathers from the wings because on those feathers you get quite a good barrel and it's from the barrel which is sort of the pointy tip that actually goes into the bird that you can create a quill you can create a pen and the feathers when they're first molted and it's not a case of catching a bird you wait until the bird molts so you can just pick feathers up from anywhere where there are birds like bird sanctuaries or round lakes or parks And you need to leave them to go hard, or you can harden them with heat, because they're quite soft when they're first molted. And then you simply cut a tip that looks like an old-fashioned fountain pen, a nib tip into the end, and writing with a quill on vellum is like no other writing experience in the world. It is just fantastic. How many scribes do you think were involved in the creation of the Macclesfield Alphabet book? Well, I wish I could tell you, Ellie, there are certainly far more than a couple because the styles that they are using are from different historical periods, which mean that one scribe couldn't, or one scribe and illuminator, couldn't cover the whole lot. But exactly how many scribes is very, very difficult to tell 
because even in one single alphabet style, the scribe is more proficient in one area than in another area. When I went through it really carefully with a magnifying glass, you can see that this is you know, a much better, much stronger, much firmer, much more determined, perhaps even a much more masterful line, whereas elsewhere in another letter on the same page, that line was much weaker. Now, was it two scribes? Or was it someone who, you know, was getting a little bit sort of that dead time in the middle of the afternoon and a bit tired and not concentrating so much? So it's very, very difficult to tell how many were involved, but certainly more than one. There's great variety in the technicality of the alphabet. Some are fairly simple and others include complex arrangements of people and animals entwined. Can you explain how scribes would go about creating these scripts and also the beautiful borders? Well, one of the most fascinating and exciting things for me in looking really closely at the Macclesfield Alphabet book was finding traces of a red pigment, which is probably Armenian bowl, which is a red, very, very fine clay pigment. Because when I went to college to learn how to be a scribe and illuminator, we were told not to use any lead pencil on the vellum, or as little as possible and certainly not transfer our design using a carbon-based tracing paper or scribbling on the back of tracing paper and doing it like that to keep the graphite from a lead pencil away from the skin because the skin is unlike paper. And where there were hairs in the skin, which obviously the hairs have now been removed, the fine carbon pigment would actually go into the skin and make it dirty. So we made our own Armenian bowl carbon paper, and it looks to me very much like the people working on the Macclesfield Alphabet book did exactly the same. Because when you're painting medieval manuscripts, the process is very, very different from watercolor painting and oil painting. Because what has to happen is that the design has to be completely decided before it's transferred. It's not a process where you can just move a tree to one side or move the figure uh, a little bit to the left. So once that design is transferred onto the skin, then the outline is gone over with a red pigment, which in medieval times was a lead-based pigment called minium, M-I-N-I-U-M. -I -I and because the minium outlined the illustrations, the illuminations in medieval books, and because they were often small, Minium gave the name miniature. They're not miniature because they're small, they're miniatures because they're outlined in Minium. Having done that, then the gold is put down, and this is why your design has to be absolutely secure before you start. So the gold is laid down, this is pure leaf gold on a cushion, and you can see this towards the end of the Macclesfield alphabet book in the painted borders, a cushion of a substance which is called gesso, which basically is slaked plaster of Paris with various additions of glues and gums. Pure leaf gold is laid on that, and then the colour applied. And I always describe manuscript painting a little bit like painting by numbers. So you put down all the base colours, then you add the highlights, then you add the tones and the shades, and then, very last of all, you add the white lines and the black outline, and that really brings the whole thing to life. But I'm sorry to say that the artist who painted the borders at the back of the book was not very proficient. He didn't know how to handle the paint terribly well because his dots and his white lines and his use yellow as well are a bit clumsy. So when I was uh, copying a stage by stage of a border so that I could show in my introduction how this was produced, I actually had to use paint like he did. And as, a, as someone who takes a bit of pride in their work, I thought, hmm, people might think this is actually how I do paint, when actually I can paint a bit better than that. You've mentioned the colours in this manuscript, and some of them are incredibly vivid, such as rich oranges, greens and pinks. How were these created? But well, they were created by using or obtaining either pigment from minerals, and the most famous one of all, I suppose, for all of us, is ultramarine, which is uh, the Latin for sort of over the sea or beyond the seas. And this is a pigment from the stone lapis lazuli, which is this brilliant blue, 
And if you think of the funeral mask of Tutankhamun with those strips of gold and blue, that is the blue of lapis lazuli. And if you think about the transport at the time, this came all the way from Afghanistan, a place called sar a sang a place of the stone in northwest Afghanistan. And um, an artist working around the time, perhaps a little bit later than the Makassar alphabet book, gave some recipes and described pigments. And he called lapis lazuli a color illustrious, beautiful and perfect beyond all other colors. And it certainly is. This would be ground to a powder and then egg yolk or whipped egg white to take the stringiness out of egg white and then the liquid underneath the foam used because, of course, it's not like a watercolour where the glue is already added or oil pigments where there is oil in it and that's already just to put on a canvas. There is nothing to keep just the pigment onto a surface, so you need to add glue or a gum. Later, gum Arabic would have been used, but in those times, it was generally egg. Now, the red vermilion comes from Spain. Vermilion is mercuric sulfide, so it's very, very poisonous. And it was even more dangerous working in a mercury mine, a vermilion mine, than it would be in a coal mine. Another red was red ochre, which in medieval times was called rubrica. And that was used to do the titles and the subtitles. And that's how we get the word rubric. A lot of pigments come from uh, mineral sources, burnt sienna, raw sienna, burnt umber, and raw umber. And these are just excavated, ground down, and mixed, as I said, with the egg. Now, as well, we get pigments from plants. And perhaps the most famous of that for us in Britain is woad, which Julius Caesar described um, as the Britons having painted themselves with woad, which is a blue color. And in southern Europe, this would be indigo, which is a dark blue color and was a color that William Morris went and did a lot of research into, getting back to this wonderfully deep blue color. Another color from a plant source was the color that was used for writing, and this is black from oak galls, which is produced from um, the gall wasp laying its egg on an oak tree, and this would be the result of a secretion that it makes in reaction to the gall wasp, which then would have been crushed, mixed with copper ash, which was ferrous sulfate, left for a few days, and then a gum added so that, again, it stuck to the surface. One of the colours that they had a lot of difficulty with, though, was green. And you would have thought that being surrounded as we are in England's green and pleasant land, that it wouldn't be a problem to us getting green. But simply boiling leaves doesn't give us a good green of a permanent colour. And so the green that was used quite often was the green that we see around in very many war memorials because they have a lot of copper in them. And this is verdigris, Greek green. In Germany, actually, it's called Spanish green. But verdigris, Greek green. Uh, but the problem with this, it is it's so corrosive and it doesn't really mix well with other colours. In fact, if you put it next to lead white, uh, the two react really, really badly against one another. Then the last lot of colours come from animals. And perhaps the most famous of all of those is the colour purple, which is Tyrian purple from the town of Tyre. And this comes from sea mollusks, a little mollusk called Murex brandaris, which, when you hoik it out of its shell, squeeze a little cyst and you get one drop of white liquid. This was the colour that the senators in Roman times used to dye a border in their togas and Roman emperors wore this wonderful purple colour, uh, which is actually a more browny colour um, than we would expect purple. It's not quite the colour of the Queen's robes. And another colour which comes from animals would be the sepia colour from the ink sacs of a squid, which was used both as a colour and also as an ink. Thank you for speaking to me today, Patricia. You're very welcome, Ellie. The Macclesfield Alphabet Book, a facsimile, is available from the British Library Shop and online shop for £30. You've been listening to a British Library podcast. For more information, visit 